Good morning and welcome to another episode of the National Security Space Association Space Time interview series. Thank you for spending your valuable time with us today. My name is Chris Williams and I have the privilege of serving as chair of NSSA's Mormon Center for Space Studies. General Tom Mormon was a legend in the storied history of America's National Security Space Program and we at NS NSSA are proud to honor his name and legacy. We're honored to have with us today Mr. Michael Roberts, Director and Program Executive Officer of the Space Rapid Capabilities Office or Space RCO or SPARCO as some call it, located at uh, Kirtland Air Force Base in New Mexico. The mission of Space RCO is to develop and deliver operationally dominant space capabilities at the speed of warfighting relevance. The Space RCO was created in response to the National Defense Strategy calling for rapid improvements to defense acquisition. Space RCO was established via the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2018 with subsequent authorities defined in the NDAA for FY19. It was designated as the first direct reporting unit of the US Space Force in 2020. As Space RCO's Senior Acquisition Officer, Mr. Roberts is responsible for and oversees space-based research development and acquisition activities for classified space acquisition programs assigned to the Space RCO. In his PEO capacity, Mr. Roberts is responsible for development and delivery of a robust portfolio of major acquisition programs to provide game-changing operational space capabilities to enhance the nation's ability to fight and win wars against increasingly well-armed adversaries. As part of his distinguished career, Mr. Roberts was appointed to the Senior Executive Service in 2017. In his previous position as the Navy's Director for Development and Integration, PEO Integrated Warfare Systems, he integrated system requirements and resources for combat systems, associated elements, and facilitated the execution of effective system engineering processes for Navy surface combat system capabilities. His career spans over 25 years in support of the US Navy and US Air Force, both as a veteran and acquisition professional. We've invited Mr. Roberts to make some opening remarks, then we'll turn to q and I'll have a few questions to start, but if members of our audience would like to pose a question to Mr. Roberts, please do so by pressing the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. I will endeavor to get through as many of your questions as possible in the allotted time of 60 minutes. And a quick reminder, on July 13th, beginning at 11 a.m., we will host an online top secret SCI level briefing on foreign space and counter space threats to US national security space systems with Mr. Jeff Gossel from the National Air and Space Intelligence Center. This is the third in our semi-annual space threats briefing series. But without further ado, it's my great honor to welcome to, uh, to space time today, Mr. Mike Roberts, sir, thank you for your outstanding service to our great nation and the floor is yours. I understand you'll have some slides to go through with us and uh, we look forward to your presentation. So thanks again for your time, Mike. Terrific. Thanks, Chris. And thanks to NSSA for having me uh, talk today. I, I, um, this may be a little different than uh, some of the ones you've seen in the past because uh, I, I'm gonna run this as a little bit of a more unstructured kind of approach here. I, I really wanna get to the questions that's what this is really all about. I mean, there's obviously um, a lot in my bio about where I've been, what I've been doing, but you know, that's that's uh, least important. What's most important is what we're doing now and what we're doing for the nation to get after rapid acquisition. And, and that's really what I wanna go talk about here. Um, so I'm gonna go through a few slides, um, but I will uh, again, try to get through these quickly. So if I if I don't say something on these slides, don't, don't worry about that. We're gonna hit them in the Q and A and I'm gonna go dive into as much as I possibly can. So I look forward to your uh, to your questions. So uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. So I'm gonna talk to you real quickly about our authorities, how we go fast, um, some tailored approaches we use, um, a process we call robust business intelligence, which I think will uh, relate to a few of the people in the audience uh, with respect to our outreach and how we get after uh, uh, um, uh, businesses and non-traditional to, to, to kind of close that gap of speed in the upfront aspects. And then and in the end, it's all about successes and metrics, right? You can talk about it all day. You can, you can uh, create new organizations and new structures, but if you don't deliver, then what does it matter? So I'm gonna show you how we've delivered so far. I'm gonna talk to you a little bit more about how we're gonna deliver in the near future. So if we can go to the next slide, I'll go through these kind of uh, fairly quickly. So um, as Chris said, this is uh, how we were created in law in 2018, which is, um, which I, I call out a few times in here, um, but the, you, the, the importance of it can't be overstated. And that is uh, the fact that we are in law. A lot of things we do um, and how we operate are defined in law. And that's important because people try to chip away at that and 
it's in law, right? So, so there's goodness here, and I'll and I'll hit on it a few times. So, uh, stood up in Kirtland Air Force Base. Very um, Senator Heinrich was very uh, uh, vocal about where we should be and how we should operate, and he's a huge proponent of ours. And so we are in Kirtland Air Force Base, and and the U.S. Space Force uh, is proud to have us here, uh, side by side with AFRL, uh, who is uh, RV and RD, who are part of the U.S. Space Force as well. Um, so. First programs assigned by the board of directors in 31 January, and then just remember this date because everything from a timeline uh, perspective started on 31 January, and you'll see just how rapid we've actually been able to do some acquisition things based on that date. And then we are a direct reporting unit, so I have a uniqueness of being having uh, more than one boss. I mean, I guess that's not unique in the Department of Defense, but I I actually have by law a few. One is uh, the CSO. I report directly to uh, General Raymond. And then I also report to the board of directors who's chaired by the secretary of the Air Force uh, by law. And then the third one by law that I kind of report to, but get we were get our requirements from is General Dickinson of Commander of US Space Comm. So he, uh, that position right now, General Dickinson is the only person uh, that can assign requirements to the space RCO. And uh, there's uniqueness there and it's importance uh, that I'll talk about in the next few slides here. Um, not only am I the director, but I'm also the program executive officer and that doesn't sound like a big deal, but from an organizational perspective, it is a huge deal, right? I can get after the organized piece of it, but also the acquisition piece in-house. Right? I can get the right people to fulfill the acquisition vision that I have and put those two together. So next. So we, like I talked about from a requirement standpoint, we are exempt from JSIDs by law. Hey, everybody would say, that's the greatest thing ever. That must be the secret sauce to getting things done. It's not like we're running with uh, running with scissors or anything. We're, we're not running open loop here. We get our requirements through a process that is instantiated at the US Spacecom and it's, it, it, it includes the joint aspects of what we will deliver. So don't think of it as we're doing space for the sake of space. Everything we do has a joint component to it and it still meets and, and is required to interoperate at the joint level. So. Again, the JSID uh, exemption is great. Uh, it does save us time, but we're still required to still meet all of those same aspects uh, that you would come out of JSID. So um, our time sensitive requirements um, uh, get after the most critical aspects of the uh, space capabilities. So, you know, things like GPS and things like that, you won't find us doing those. Those are more long-term big, uh, acquisition programs, that's not what we do. We're the really the two to five year from instantiation uh, of a requirement all the way through operation and or delivery and operation in the two to five year time frame. Um, that is what we get after. And, and there is a whole host of things to, to do that. And we'll talk about that more in the questions that I have seen. So I'll get after the, the details of that. Um, our programs, so after the commander signs the requirement, we then formulate a program out of it. Um, uh, acquisition program, and we take that to the board of directors uh, that's chaired by the Secretary of the Air Force, and they approve it. So there's, um, I don't want you to think this is a very insular program or, or uh, process. It's not. So our board of directors includes uh, the Secretary of the Air Force, the CSO, the Chief of Staff of the Air Force, Commander U.S. Space Com, and then two other key ones, which are uh, OSD r &E and a and &S. So uh, they're on our board as well. Um, as 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 voting or as members, and uh, there, there's goodness there, right? So by having them on our board, it, it really accomplishes. I'll say two things, but one of them is the key importance. Why right? OSD is the oversight for acquisition. So our concept from a bureaucracy busting uh, is that we have OSD on our board of directors because so we give them unprecedented insight, so they don't give us all that oversight. Right? So I, I give them the information before they even have to ask for it. They're included in the process up front, and that's how we reduce the oversight that they have to give us as we go along. So it actually was working really well, and we work really well with OSD, ANS, and RD. Next slide. So again, I talked about this before, but there's really no one answer. There's no magic wand uh, of, uh, of acquisition, but I'll talk to you about some key pieces of it that make, uh, I think, us go uh, or have the ability to go a little bit what we call rapid. Jason's exemption, we talked about that. PEO authorities couldn't be more important, right? All of that is in-house. Um, out of all the programs I have, there's only one program I have to go anywhere outside of my office to execute, and that's an ACAT-1 program that I have to go, uh, or ACAT-1 equivalent program that I have to go up to um, 
uh, Ms. Costello uh, was Dr. Roper, the SAE, to, to do. And um, when the new space SAE comes in, that's who I'll report to from that perspective on that program as well. But everything else in-house. Um, operationally, I report to the Chief of Space Operations. And, and again, I'll talk to you about why that's hugely important. Contracting authorities, I'm going to discuss a lot of it on the next slide and then some of the questions, but this is hugely important, right? I, I say contracting, security, hiring, and I leave off finance, and I shouldn't in this slide because finance is a key part of this as well. And what does that mean? It means all of our functional support is right here in-house. They work for me as the director and some of them as the PEO. But why is that important? Because I don't, we don't have to go anywhere to let a contract that's less than a billion dollars. We can do it all in-house. Uh, that is rapid. That's how you break bureaucracy. And, and again, those, I don't want you to think those authorities are, are passed down, you know, willy nilly. These people are the best of what they do. And that's why they have those authorities. And that's why we're able to go fast. Uh, it's really that aspect of it. Um, hiring authorities, we use direct hiring authority uh, that, is, uh, that is authorized through Act Demo. Uh, and then we do green, uh, for civilians and then green door hiring for military. So uh, just to give you a sense of uh, how fast we can hire, um, the average uh, time for every other, I'll say Department of the Air Force, for all the other Department of the Air Force uh, organiza acquisition organizations is about 180 days from the time you get the open billet to the time you have a firm offer out the door uh, and somebody accept it. Ours is 25 days. So, and we do the same process. It's not like we're cutting corners and not doing those things. We just we have a dedicated people that go after that because we know who we want and we go off and get them. And again, that's not just saying, okay, I want Joe Schmo on the street. It is, we do interviews, we do panels, we do all that. We just do it rapidly uh, to break that, uh, that, that thing. So th that's how you get after getting great people. Because last thing you want to do is find a great person and then take 180 days to, to give them an offer. That sounds like way too long for the best talent out there. Uh, and so we, we try to break that aspect of it as well. Um, all authorities are maximally delegated. Um, I couldn't, I can't uh, harp, harp on this one enough. So what does that mean? It means me as the PEO, I don't really don't have a job. I delegate my authority down to my SMLs and MLs that run, they run the programs. The PMs on these, on our, on, in our building really have decision space that costs cost schedule and performance in their portfolio. That's it. They don't have to come to me unless it is required by law. That's how you go fast is find the right people, give them the authority they need and get out of their way. I'm here to remove roadblocks. That's all I'm here for. And they're the best of the best. I'll tell you, we have the greatest PMs and they, you know, some people would say, well, I think the PMs are, would be afraid to have that kind of authority. Absolutely not. They want that authority and they want to go deliver and they are executing, uh, like you'll see in a few slides here on a success, but they're executing amazingly well. So that's how we operate here at Space RCO. Next. Contracting authorities. So we have a SCO in our, um, um, in, 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 that works for me, basically. He's the senior contracting official um, that is delegated directly from um, AQC. Uh, so General Holt gives him his authority and he gives him a $1 billion business contract cl uh, uh, clearance authority, which I talked about before. Um, doesn't make us go outside. We've had to go outside of the office four times. And in those four times, it took less than 24 hours to get approval. Uh, and that's because General Holt would be the approving authority for those. And he has a direct, our, our, our SCO has a direct line with General Holt because he understands the importance of what we do and the importance of doing it rapidly. Um, plus he gives us the best uh, of his O6s to be in this position. Um, and he can trust them. So he, they know what information to take general hold if that decision is required. So it's a, it's a two-way street there. Um, and this just kind of goes through. He's also uh, my competition and commercial advocate um, to, get after, uh, um, to get after how we compete. Um, competition is our baseline. That's what we go in as a starting point for everything. But there's obviously reasons to sole source and, and do different acquisition strategies to get after capability uh, rapidly and, and we have the authority and the ability to go do that as required. We also use other transaction authorities um, to enter into. We we uh, recently uh, released, uh, actually it's been about a year now, but we, we were one of the first ones in the entire Department of Defense to use a multi-award uh, OTA uh, that's managed by the government. So that was um, 
uh, something that was a very uh, interesting undertaking and it's proven to be probably the smartest thing we ever did as far as getting software developed rapidly for our GC3 system. Next. Um, so one size fits all is not a part of our strategy. We really go after things individually. So we'll, we'll tailor the acquisition strategy and approach on absolutely every program we have because they're all different. And that, that purview falls within uh, our PCOs and PMs who all work side by side uh, to decide what the best way to get after to give that flexibility and, and also uh, do the right thing from a government perspective uh, that balances cost schedule and performance uh, to deliver those capabilities. Uh, it's not always just about schedule. Uh, it's about cost and performance as well. And, and we try to balance all those and, and having those teams work together is how you get those balances uh, right. Um, we endorse several small businesses, uh, SBIRs, I should say. Um, and we, we do that through our labs mainly, uh, as well as some other, uh, some other um, uh, organizations that are just standing up um, like Space Safari and, and so forth and so on like those. So um, we are, um, we are trying to uh, get after non-traditional and, uh, and maybe small businesses uh, because that's another way to get after things very quickly um, is, to, is to go after those, um, those smaller things that are a little bit more mature in some cases and we can transition them fast. Next slide. Uh, okay, so a little bit of our successes and, and I'd be happy to go into these as much as I can. Obviously our portfolios for the most part highly classified and everybody kind of here knows that, but I can talk a little bit about in generically about what we've been doing. We're, we're executing 13 acquisition programs, getting ready to be about 14. We just had one assigned by our board of directors recently. Um, we do it with very small teams. Um, of those uh, now uh, 14 programs, we have about five people on average on each program. That's it. Uh, that's the way we keep our organization uh, small and agile. And we also just put the best of the best on those programs and they all know experts in what they do and can go get it done with a smaller team. Now we do leverage other teams. Um, as we work, we leverage uh, some SMC, we leverage the t and &E community, we leverage the operational community to make sure that uh, we get after uh, uh, making sure that what we deliver is what they need. Um, and, and then also as we transition our programs over to other organizations for long-term sustainment and, and production, they are ready to accept as well. Okay, so in just under two years, actually, or just over two years from that uh, 19 date, we have awarded now almost 50 contracts, even uh, this is stuck at 40, but we're about at 50 now. We'll definitely be at about 50 to 55 by the end of this fiscal year um, with only about 13 contracting professionals. And like I said, uh, a match of about 13 PMs uh, working side by side with them. Um, we average about less than nine months from program assignment to release of RFP, even for uh, very large programs, uh, ECAT one equivalent programs and about five months from RFP to release uh, to award, which is unheard of really, if you think about it. Um, went from uh, acquisition, acquisition approval to award with, without protest about 156 days on a major engineering technical support uh, contract, um, as, which anybody on here that's part of a kind of CETA type thing, that's, a, <laughs> that's almost unheard of with respect to getting that done fastly and not getting, not getting protested on those. Uh, mm -hmm. Um, completely, uh, competitively selected again, the first large acquisition program for the Space Force. So after Space Force stood up, we went after a very large acquisition and uh, successfully awarded it um, in about eight months faster than the DOD average, which is, is uh, cutting off some real timelines. And uh, again, we did that just by uh, breaking the bureaucracy and, 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 really, uh, and really just uh, uh, bunkering down and, and getting after uh, how we do um, uh, getting award uh, contracts on awarded. Awarded nine small business contracts that had been dominated by large businesses uh, for the most part, uh, which is a key part of what we do to get after those non-traditional pieces. Uh, and then no, attend no cost contracts. Like I said, we're in a pretty uh, interesting uh, uh, security posture, uh, just given what we do and, and, and the law that was read out. And that is uh, get the no cost contracts allow us to get more and more companies in to kind of talk about what they're doing and, and, and more importantly, talk about what we're doing and where we're headed. So they get the opportunity to, uh, to either, you know, kind of invest their IRAD or, or fi figure out how maybe some of their systems they're already developed and fit, fit in those gaps that we have. Um, we recently did a, um, a um, um, industry day, uh, classified industry day. I think we had a 75 to 100 people per attend, which was, awesome. It gives everybody a kind of view of what we're doing. So we're trying to find creative ways to, to kind of break that uh, 
that black wall down with respect to classification and get as many people in there as we can because that can only uh, that can only help us and and the companies out there. So next slide. Um, so this is a business intelligence. I, I won't talk too much about this because I, I think a couple of the questions hit on this, but and, and I've hit it on it before. We um, we uh, to go fast. We're not an S and T organization. We transition uh, more mature technology and we transition it quickly. Uh, so we, we close the valley of death. Um, uh, basically, that's our job is to get that done and, and, and do it quickly. Um, we are open invitation for industry to talk to us about what they're doing. And in uh, the slides is how we go after that. And, and please email us. We, we have people on the other end just waiting for those emails to come in and set up those talks with everybody. So we're, we're excited to talk about what people are doing and how they might feel what we have going on. Um, we're heavily networked. I talked a little bit about this. We, we get really into the innovation hubs and the labs and the other acquisition organizations and venture capitals and, and, and really importantly, the end users and how we, uh, how we interface with them. And I'll talk about that in one of the questions as well, um, which is a uniqueness of how we do things. Um, and again, we have multiple approaches um, to uh, to uh, how we uh, how we try to get people to to kind of fill the gaps that we have uh, rapidly. So I talked about portfolio days and then IRAD and um, uh, we had we draft we help draft statements uh, of external investment for uh, multiple different entities to help make sure we uh, we get after um, uh, um, technology that may fill some gaps that we have. Um, I think earlier I said Space Safari, I really meant Space Prime. Uh, Space Safari is an organization out at uh, SMC who's doing really non-programmer record, smaller, uh, smaller rapid programs, but, but um, Space Prime we work with uh, very well to, to get after the SBIR piece. Next slide. Um, again, examples of BI in action, I won't recently, we Space, Co Space Com Entrepreneur Summit that we did last year. I actually just did one again yesterday. Um, and then uh, continuous and tar target market research. Uh, we have a group, uh, we have a person internal of the office who is our business intelligence, uh, his name is Severin, and he, uh, he'd be happy to hear from you for that email earlier. And we really wanna get after um, this, this uh, business intelligence to expand our reach and, and, and uh, make sure we pull in all the technology that's out there uh, if it fits uh, what we have going on. So go next slide, please. I think that's close, right? Okay, so connect with us on Facebook and LinkedIn. Uh, we have speaking engagement interview requests and then I guess the business development engagement request. Um, please email any of these or all of these and, and we will definitely get back to you if, uh, if we think there's a, a good connection there. So, hey, I'm ready for questions now, Chris. I'm all in, I'm ready, I'm excited. Well, that's great, Mike. Thank you so much for your introductory comments. We appreciate it very much. Very helpful uh, overview of what you're doing and how you do it. And congratulations on the success you've had today. Um, you noted uh, that the that the space RCO has a, a unique management structure, and you report to a board of directors. And you mentioned the the high powered officials that uh, that populate that board. How does this work in practice? How many times does the board of directors meet? What do they typically do? They approve programs? Do they look at budgets? You know, what, a what do they do? And and secondly, um, in your opinion, is this type of oversight arrangement extendable to other military space programs? Uh, as, can it scale to other activities or is it really unique to what you do? And, and if so, why is it unique? Okay, so a couple things here. So our board of directors is, uh, I mentioned this before, but it's required by law. Um, so it wasn't thought of as a best practice. It was more kind of, I'll say forced upon, uh, but it's a good thing, right? It's a great thing for organizations like like mine, who are who don't take on everything, right? So the purpose of the board is to really hone in on: Are we taking on the right things for Space RCO, and are, are there the programs that they are assigned um, really rapid? Does it fit into our context? So, would would I think that it would be beneficial to everybody? Probably not, right? Some people doesn't really make sense in the larger, bigger things, but it really helps. Uh, us really kind of um, focus in on what we're doing. The reason for the high powered aspect of it is exactly what you mentioned, right? So you go to the board of directors with these programs and you lay out what you're gonna do and the timelines you're gonna do it on. And then they help you resource it, whether it be people, uh, priority of uh, funding, so forth and so on to make sure that you deliver on those timelines. Because with the combatant commander sitting in the bod, 
he is the timeline guy. He's like, I, I need it at this point. And it shows him that the chief and the secretary are behind that and are willing to put resources behind it as well to make sure that happens. So that's the importance of the BOD for us. But do I think it would work for everybody? No. But one thing it does provide us that I think everybody can learn from is it, is it has rapid decision-making capability. Right. So when I need a decision made, I go to that body. And I, when I told you who sits in there, if anybody thinks any of those are not willing to make a decision, they all they all want to make a decision. So we just have to bring them the right information. So it, rapid decision wise, that is a big way we get after getting those decisions quickly. Um, we only do bods when we need them. I don't want to get all those people together every two, three, six months, whatever it is, just to say, hey, everything's going great. I really don't need anything from you. That's not the purpose. Right. It would die quickly if we did that. So. Uh, so far, we we probably do one um, on average about once uh, once every six months, so twice a year uh, is what we're looking at. But given our portfolio is about where I want it to be between 13 and 15 programs, I don't see a lot happening uh, over the next year or so. There may be one over the next year, but that's about it. Got it. Thank you. Uh, among your key operating principles is early and consistent warfighter involvement. You stress that in your in your slides and in your discussion. Can you describe how this works in practice? With whom at, at US Space Command do you interact on a regular basis, aside from the commander who obviously is a member of the, the BOD? Uh, and what is the role of Space RCO's Futures Division in this effort? Are they the primary linkage between the, the two organizations? How, how does that work in practice? Okay, so, so first of all, um, we interact uh, with US Space Com at just about every level, the J8, Bob Thomas, uh, down to the J3 and J5, which are really what drives our requirements and, and operational needs. Um, we, we don't just interface with the commander, which we do a lot anyway, but we, we kind of do it all up and down. And that's a key important aspect of, of uh, that. But when I get after users, right? So as you know, the US Space Force is kind of the users. They're the operators. They provide the operators to the combatant commander who then vectors them to. Uh, so when I say users and operators, that's who I mean. Right. So after the U.S. Spacecom provides the requirement and flushes out, you know, the capabilities they need, um, we go off and work with the users. So what we give them is what they really need versus what we thought they wanted. And I mean that from the aspect of, of how it operates, how they would use it exactly uh, and how it fits in the larger context. So so we the way it works is from day zero, um, we work with uh, Spock, uh, the Spock command, who. Uh, Space Operations Command, who provides us, okay, it's going to go to this delta. Uh, they're the ones who are going to operate it. We go to that delta and, and get operators to come into the program office with us, and we walk through. Here are the con ops. Here's how it's going to be used. Here's what we're going to show you from a user perspective. What else do we need to provide you? And we do that all the way along the way so that in the end, it's just a, literally the transition is so easy because they already know exactly what they're getting, and they helped us build it. Um, so other organizations have different models for that. I'm not saying any of them are right or wrong, um, but when we started uh, this organization, that was one of the key aspects of what I wanted to get after. And I learned that from my Navy experience where we used to build things in a, in a, uh, in a lab somewhere for four years, and then we would kind of throw it over the fence and give them a couple of years to kind of work with it. And we don't do that here. We do that in parallel so that uh, when the co combatant commander says I need it by this time frame, it is it is literally operational by that time frame, not just a demo or or, or prototype. It is uh, it is really operational, and it's what the users are already trained to use and can go off and use it. So that's kind of how we get after that. It's a huge importance. Our futures division you mentioned. So think of futures in in this case as what future capabilities we see coming down the pipe, not necessarily futures. Uh, handover. We have a uh, we have a organization or we have a piece of my organization called our transition cell. That's what they do. They're the ones who interface with the operators. They're the ones who interface with um, the future acquisition organizations who will also uh, hand this over to for long term sustainment and pr and maybe mass production of the systems we're building. So that is the organization that you would want to talk to uh, if you want to talk about transition. But we have a cell that that's all they they're just focused on transition and make sure we're in, interfacing with those organizations. That's great. Thank you. I want to turn to uh, how your organization interacts with other uh, national security space organ acquisition organizations. Um, what's the relationship between the space RCO and say SMC special programs, for example, and, and there are others, you know, I wanted to especially ask you about the relationship between your organization 
an Air Force RCO that is mm -hmm. engaged in certain uh, space related activities. Yeah, so there's a lot of uh, conjecture about, you know, we need to go to one acquisition organization for all of space. And, and I know that's what everybody's getting at with this question and I get it. Um, uh, do I think that's the right answer? Mike's answer to that is not right now. I don't think that makes sense where we are today. Um, now, with that aside, we have a, a we have a uh, I'll say a meeting for lack of a better term called the PIC, the Program Integration Council, which is really about how we collaborate and communicate across all of the different organizations to make sure what we're doing from a space perspective is aligned. Um, that has been going really well. I mean, it, it, is, it includes DAF RCO, it includes SMC, it includes MDA, it includes NRO, every, all the space um, kind of uh, uh, players. That's how we communicate and collaborate. But with respect to specifically SMC, I mean, our relationship couldn't be better. We, we communicate with them on a daily, if not more than once a day uh, perspective, because like I talked about, all of our programs that we're developing, we're going to do the first couple of them potentially, and then transition those to more likely for the most part, SMC, um, you know, SP, SY, all those other organizations, and, and they have to be ready to catch it. So the way we do that is we communicate often. And as a matter of fact, some of our programs there, they have deputy program managers that sit right with our program managers as we're building those systems. So they're, again, they're ready to catch those. So I, I don't think there's uh, any kind of animosity between us. I think it, everybody understands the differences between um, what we do and what they do. And when I say everybody, I mean internal to the US Space Force. Um, but also um, there is a, you know, there is a, a, an understanding of which, which programs we take on versus which ones the DAF RCO takes on, which one SP takes on. Um, and uh, we use that kind of rubrics to figure out where they go. Um, now, will Space RCO ever take on everything that the DAF RCO is taking on? No, it doesn't make sense, right? Why would you break things midstream just because somebody's called the Space RCO? That doesn't make any sense. So, plus they have more than we could ever take on anyway. They, they, they do a lot of great things um, and they have the expertise to do them. I, I, I wouldn't want to venture into that at all. So I think there's a, there's a balance there, and, but we all get along. It's not like we're all fighting for anything. It, we have enough work to go around. We, it's just making the right decisions to where they should go based on you know, a bunch of different factors. Right, thank you. Um, though I'm, undoubtedly, there are many in our audience uh, who are keenly interested in what future capabilities Space RCO is seeking to develop in order to assist our space warfighters. Uh, what, if anything, can you tell us uh, about in this unclassified uh, forum? Tell us about possible future contracting opportunities for, for US industry. Yeah, so I, I can't talk specifics about what we're gonna go off and do. Uh, um, um, first of all, you know, I, I don't make up my own program, so I kind of get told what to do. But uh, secondly, um, the, the thing that I would say is uh, we're, we have, we've had a industry day, we'll have more industry days, uh, classified industry days, and, and I put up the links earlier about how to get in touch with us. That's how I would say you would want to get in touch with us. Um, and then to get in the loop of, we'll talk about where we see things going uh, what we know some of the gaps are and how, we, how we're looking to fill those. That's how we get after spreading the word about where Space RCO is going and some of the gaps we're going to look to fill in the future. So the last thing I want to do is come off to industry and go, hey, I'm going to go build this widget and it looks exactly like this. That's not how we do business, right? I go after it as here is the, here is the effect we need or the, uh, or the gap we're trying to fill. You tell me how you would do it. And that's the, that's the way we get at making a robust industry base because there's a, dumper, a thousand different ways to solve a problem potentially. I'm looking for the best of the best and I want everybody's opinion on that. So we kind of do it a little differently, um, but, but as far as what's coming down the pipe, those industry days are gonna happen. We're gonna have another one uh, coming up real soon that you'll hear about. And, and I ask that everybody uh, participate in that. We'll definitely open it up to anybody that wants to attend if you think that you are, um, uh, that you're interested in what Space RCO is doing. Thanks. Uh, we have a question from the audience that is uh, related to the role of FFRDCs. Um, uh, how is your organization seeking to ensure fair competitions uh, for commercial companies and firewalling elements of F the FFRDC that are also vying for Space RCO business? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, so the answer uh, is that we look for commercial first, uh, as far as production of capabilities. Um, I, I do not believe, this Mike's a belief, I do not believe FFRDCs uh, are the best to do most of those. 
Now there are some risk reduction capa uh, uh, development we do with our FFRDCs on some capabilities, but that's just what it is. It's risk reduction. It's not long-term uh, program of records. It's none of that stuff. We don't do that with our uh, FFRDC. So um, we, if firewalls are required, we'll absolutely do that. And we've done that in the past uh, to make sure that there's no conflict of interest there. Um, but, but also I think it's important to have uh, FFRDCs help us when it comes to technology uh, um, assessment uh, because they're the experts in it. I'm not, uh, that's not what we do, right? So we do bring them in when we need to. Um, but again, as far as long-term, uh, uh, I guess, uh, uh, competition between uh, commercial and them, that, it doesn't exist in our organization and it, and it won't exist in our organization. We go commercial first. Now, commercial comes back and goes, I can't do that or I'm not willing, then, then we have to look at alternatives. But that's the only time that would be the fallback. Another question from the audience is uh, as follows. Organizations like the DAF, RCO, Space RCO, Space Development Agency, pride themselves on being outside of the space systems command with all these acquisition organizations operating independently of SSC. Is the program integration council sufficient to get unity of effort uh, for the Space Force? So, so what I would say is today, yes it is. As of today, do I think ultimately some, if not all those organizations need to align a little bit better. Yes, they do. Um, Mike's opinion of why that isn't uh, the best thing to do right now is because SSC needs to get stood up and organized before you throw everything in the, in the bucket, right? So, so right now, um, I mean, there's no, nobody would deny that the way SMC was constructed before 2.0 was very monolithic, right? The bureaucracy that included in the organization was just inherent in the years and years of how it got built and things put on top of things and so forth and so on. They are trying to fix that. Uh, my, my statement about kind of not now means I want to allow them to fix that aspect of it first and then let's make a decision together as a U.S. Space Force, uh, um, um, I guess, space capability development uh, organization, larger organization or ecosystem of how that should fold together if it needs to. Um, ultimately, do, does everything need to fall under SSC? I don't think it does. Um, I think they're keeping a couple of things here and there gives you a sense of healthy uh, tension or I'll say healthy competition, even inside the acquisition uh, realms of the US Space Force. And, and that makes sense to me. Um, so that, that would be the way I would answer that. Maybe I didn't answer it completely, but I'll say that that's where we stand today. And the PIC is a great way of collaborating and communicating across those organizations and it's working really well. That's great, Mike, thank you. We have a question from General Les Lyles, former uh, Commander of Air Force Material Command and the Vice Chief of Staff of the Air Force. Thanks for your question, General Lyles. It says, uh, thank you and congratulations on all that you're doing. I know your space RCO culture cannot be universally applied, but much of your authorities and culture are needed in many of the rest of the acquisition programs. Are you trying to share lessons learned and best practices with the broader acquisi space acquisition enterprise? And also, are you working with NASA in any way? Yeah, so thanks, General. I appreciate the question. So the answer is yes, but. So uh, yes, in that some of the things we do could be applied. Um, so let me give you an example. Early warfighter involvement. That just makes sense to me. Should it be applied across everything? I believe so. Um, so now that needs to be tailored, I'm sure, to some systems, but I, I got it. Um, there's also about, you know, breaking bureaucracy where you are really lowering the level of approval required for every little action. Um, so pushing authorities down to the right levels in, in the organization, that should be universal. I mean, that is how you kill bureaucracy is just have the right people making the right levels of decisions. We don't all do that. We need to do that. Um, the other one is um, functional support embedded. Um, a lot of people say, well, that'll grow the size of organizations, but it really doesn't. If you think about my organization alone, I have 150 people total. And of those 150 people, only about 80 of them are government civilians. Um, and, and of those, only 13 of them are program managers and 13 of them are, are PCOs. And then they have the security staff. So, so it's not like it has to grow tremendously. If you look at some of the other organizations, they're 10 times that size easily. Um, so having functional support embedded does one thing. It gives everybody the same sense of urgency. So when you create contracts or you mods or make programmatic decisions, you're all doing it together based on cost schedule and performance balanced. 
And the only way to do that is be have that embedded and I'll be on the same uh, sheet of music. So I think those aspects of it can really get after uh, the larger acquisition community and be spread across there. There are some that, to be honest with you, can't, like I said earlier, the BOD aspect doesn't necessarily, in my mind, translate across all of acquisition organizations. It just doesn't work, uh, work out that well. Um, so there are that piece of it. Um, the things we have in law do help us um, kind of break through some of the muck. Um, and so there is that, the goodness there. And uh, the other thing I would say, um, and I mentioned it as transition, you know, I mentioned as like warfighter involvement, but the key, the reason I am, I'll say forced, but I'm not forced is to have my chain go to the CSO and the SAE. There's a balance I have to do across those things to make sure that I develop, uh, you know, cost cutting performance rides, but also deliver capability that's useful and, and, and kind of fight for that aspect of it. So, um, and then have the user involvement through the CSO. So there, there is a, a roundness there that I think we could look at as well from a, from how the PEOs are aligned in the future. Hopefully that thank answered you. your question, General. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it very much. Um, another question from the audience, given that you are primarily in the prototype business, outcomes can be uncertain. How have the contractors performed so far and how do you plan to manage any cost overruns or schedule delays that you encounter? Yeah, so uh, let me just make it clear. We don't prototype anything. Everything we deliver is an operational capability. Uh, we take proto things that have been prototyped, whether they be smaller uh, pieces, and we integrate those into a program of record systems um, um, or systems that then become programs of record. Um, so I, I just want to make that clear. It's a, it's a little nuance of ours that we don't prototype. So, um, so we have a portfolio view. Um, we have one thing that I didn't say uh, that's in law, because I don't think it is all that important, but it seems for this question it would be, is that Space RCO will maintain one white line and one black line of funding. So we have a PE that is one black line of funding. Um, so that allows us the opportunity to make sure that we balance the portfolio as a whole. So if one thing is needs to go a little bit more quickly or needs to burn a little bit faster from a money perspective, we're able to move things around a little bit. I don't want to say it's willy nilly uh, because it's not. Um, that's one aspect of how we kind of get through that cost schedule performance thing. And, and uh, But we haven't had any overruns. And, and, and the reason why I think in my mind is because I mentioned it earlier, I don't tell the contractors what to build and all that. So they, they come to me with, with um, their solutions to our problem, number one. And secondly, um, we work with them very closely on how we, uh, how we manage cost schedule and performance. So they, they see insights into how we're doing things and, and, and help us balance that across uh, what we have them doing. Um, will we never have uh, overruns? Sure we will, right? Everybody is going to have that just, just because of requirements, uh, uh, trades and things like that. So. Uh, we'll try to manage that internal. And if not, that's why I have a direct line to the CSO and, and to the board of directors who can assist me in, in uh, finding the resources we need uh, internal to either the U.S. Space Force or the Department of the Air Force. Um, and, and so there are ways that we can get after that uh, to, to help us make sure that we stay on schedule. Another question is, um, how, how do you consider the interactions with industry teams a priority um, and can you highlight some space RCO initiatives to expand your interactions with a broader set of companies that are either internally funded to invest in new developments or are in line with your technology and system development needs? Yeah, so I didn't, I don't know if I really understood the first part of the question, but I will say that from a initiatives, we use a lot of other organizations uh, as ways to get, so we use our, uh, our labs, uh, so AFRL, as well as uh, on the Navy side, NRL, to kind of get after uh, all those uh, technologies that we don't necessarily have insight to or that aren't mature as we would want them to be yet. And, and plus those, they have a more robust uh, uh, infrastructure to go after all those different companies and, and non-traditional. So we do use them a lot, but we're also getting involved with, um, like I said, SpaceWorks and, and, uh, and some other organizations that help us, uh, like DIU and those that help us kind of widen our net out there a little bit. Um, so that's one way we have the industry days. Um, we're also trying to do more forums like this where we have, um, we talk about a little bit what we do and then we can get connected with people and, and then have a real uh, classified talk with them about what we're doing and, and, and kind of just kind of strengthen our thing. We, another thing that we have is uh, we have a very uh, large 
uh, when I say large, I mean the number of people, IDIQ, that we're able to get people onto for no cost that allows them to be into our ecosystem and see what we have going on um, and, and can kind of widen our thing. And that is not restricted to anybody. We, we are willing to read anybody into that that wants to do that no cost contract and really uh, make sure that we, uh, we share what we're doing and widen our net. Sorry, Chris, I can't hear you. Sorry, I was on mute momentarily. Um, speaking of, uh, of no cost contracts, we have a question from the audience. Can companies with no NCL be awarded a no cost contract? And can this contract vehicle be used to facilitate clearance sponsorship? So we can't get on the IDIQ with it, but we can have a discussion uh, on an unclassified way, and then we can sponsor uh, clearance through that mechanism. Um, you don't have to be on, the good thing about us is you don't necessarily have to be on that IDIQ. We have other mechanisms to allow you to be read into it. We can be working with you on a partnership perspective on something. But so a lot of organizations have to be on contract. And in our case, that's not necessarily true. There's a little nuance there. So I won't say everybody can. Yes, we can sponsor organizations if we see partnership potential there even. And uh, let's talk about uh, culture. Um, you have stated that delivering capabilities quickly and effectively re requires a strong core culture and mindset. How does Space RCO inculcate the culture you speak of? And what's the right blend of training and education versus hands-on doing in establishing the proper culture? You know, how do you yeah, find the people? Is, is it a matter of finding people who already have the culture inculcated or or do you do it as part of what your what your you know part of your your daily business if you will yeah so uh, it's a mixture <clears throat> I'll, I'll be honest with you so I, I when we first got here we went out and looked for people that either had experience so what does experience mean in this case it means had had some time with the DAF RCO had worked with the DAF RCO that was really the only um, mechanism we had but then we started going out and thinking differently we started looking at at ways that, uh, you know, going rapid is not necessarily, you know exactly how to do it. It's you have a desire to do things that way. And you have a desire to be a decision maker. You have a, you have a kind of a systematic way of looking at things and an engineering type mindset um, for, from an engineering perspective or from program management perspective. So it's a mixture. So there is, there is, I'll be honest with you, there's not a lot of training you can go do that says, hey, if I do this training, I will now be a rapid program officer or program manager. It doesn't work that way. Um, but I'll tell you what has happened. We went out and picked, uh, we went out and picked some program managers from military perspective from like SAS grads and, and people that are at top of their class in, in certain uh, um, uh, programs. And we did that because we know that they're A, A people, A personalities, and B, they know how to take information, uh, um, take it on quickly and make decisions and move on. That's, they have to in that fast paced environment. So we, we actually looked for those and that has worked out really well for us. Now, I will say because of how fast and out, uh, uh, kind of out of the norm we have to think as far as the amount of option space we have, we do get people for the most part that are uh, fairly well trained in acquisition. It's it, usually not their first stint in acquisition, so they need to understand the process, uh, so they know where those touch points are and in, 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 in check sheets uh, as far as what they have to do and what they don't. And so, it, I'd say it's a mixture of those two. Um, uh, there's another third aspect of that is just luck, right? So luck is luck comes in two ways. One is you make it, and one is uh, it makes you. So. We, uh, we, we've made a little bit of luck in that we've went to the right places and, and, and kind of found the right people. And the other one is uh, it made us in the fact that uh, we got our word out there, people see what we're doing and then they want to come to us because they're like, man, I was in this program office for 10 years. I never saw a single thing delivered and, and I wanna go and get after this thing. So I see something done in my career and they, they're motivated to get it done and they, they're the people who come after us. So that, I think there's goodness on both sides of that. That's great. A question from the audience, can commercial entities approach Space RCO with unsolicited proposals or only in response to formal RFPs? What's the best resource available uh, for awareness of Space RCO uh, RFPs? Where do, you, where do um, you go to find them? So we don't, we don't usually solicit on FedBizOps because of the classification of what we do. There are some on there. We've done a few um, because of the unclassified nature of them. Um, but like I said, if you connect with us and, and, and talk about your interest, 
Um, now, so if somebody's out and they're building sprinkler systems for homes, I'm probably not going to say, yeah, I want to, I think there's a connection there. So I, I don't want to just open it up to just absolutely everybody. But if, if we get connected, whether you email us or, or reach out to our business intelligence um, organization, we will connect with you and see if there's a connection there. And then if that's the case, we'll add you to our list of distribution uh, capability to uh, be on those uh, future RFP solicitations. So the only way to get after that is is have those conversations uh, because of the, I can't just read, just blanket read everybody in to everything, right? It doesn't work that way. Um, right. But if there is a connection, we can make that work. And even if it doesn't work this time, you're then on the distro for all the future ones and you can you can uh, potentially be in the uh, in, in the running for, for some of those in the future. So ho hopefully that helps. Um, our business intelligence uh, guy, Severin, and then Owen Stevenson, who is the colonel that's coming in uh, in a few days here to take over our contracting shop. He'll be happy to talk to everybody about these opportunities. Um, uh, now, Mike will say as the PEO uh, that unsolicited um, pro unsolicited proposals are not the best thing. Uh, they take a lot of time and effort. And if they don't fit our requirement space, it's kind of a waste of time on both sides of that. Um, so I would say talking to us first would be the first step to make sure that even what you're doing is in the, inside the realm of what we're even after. And then we can go from there as to the, the best mechanism. Another way that we can have conversations um, is we'll be at Space Symposium coming up. And uh, I'm not trying to promote Space Symposium, but I'll say we'll have a uh, booth there and please come by and talk to us and we'll try to see if we can get some uh, some spaces where we can have uh, different types of conversation there but I'm not sure about that yet we're working on that so we can de definitely talk about in generalities about what we're doing and see if there's a connection there though. I have a, a question about uh, commercial SATCOM uh, capabilities. How do you how would you differentiate or define the demarcations between what space RCO would acquire versus say space systems command and the Commercial SATCOM Communications Office, for example, would you envision Space RCO involvement in acquisition of communication solutions for urgent needs, like in a contested environment, or what? What role does your organization play there versus uh, the uh, the CSCO? Yeah, so there's uh, right now there's no overlap. Um, so from a commercial perspective, they're working on the Commercial SATCOM uh, piece. Now, as you know, everything we put in space has to communicate. And a matter of fact, as a, in, in, in theory, it would communicate with everything else. So there is a there is overlap in the sense of standards and how we communicate across those things. So there is from that perspective and some of the things they build may be directly applicable to what we would have to do to, to communicate across our stuff and theirs. But um, but in general, from a commercial SATCOM perspective, there is zero overlap between what we're doing and what that commercial uh, space office is doing over in SMC. And uh, before we uh, started this, you and I talked a little bit about uh, digital engineering. Yeah. Um, how valuable is modern digital engineering uh, capabilities, tools, and methodologies to the development of resilient national security space capabilities? And to what extent does the space RCO leverage such digital engineering tools and methodologies in its programs? Okay, so I'm going to answer it in reverse of what you're asking. Sure. So if you are an entity that wants to work with a space RCO, don't even show up unless you want to do digital engineering, right? To some degree, not everything needs to be, you know, model-based system engineering or anything like that, but it needs to have some sense of digital engineering. And the reason why is because we want to iterate on requirements and design trade space really rapidly. And we want to do that with, during the upfront phases of acquisition. So we get it right. And we know what our trade spaces are across those. So, from a digital engineering perspective, our, our space RCO, that is a must. That's what we do. That's what's required of us. And secondly, from a U.S. Space Force require, uh, uh, perspective, and, and again, I'm not talking on behalf of the entire U.S. Space Force, but I'll, I'll just pretend I am for a second and give you my opinion. You'll hear things like digital transformation, right? You'll hear those terminology. And, and I'll say that the space RCO or the space force is not in a position to do digital transformation, but that's a great thing. You know why? Because we're building all new stuff for, for the most part, we're in the we're in the in the mindset of digital creation. From the second we stand up as a force, we're doing everything digitally. That's a great place to be. But we need commercial and industry to kind of hop on board with that, um, because everything we build in the U.S. Space Force is not space for the sake of space. It all has a joint aspect, so we have to tie into that joint data environment. And to do that, you do it in a digital engineering, you do model-based system engineering, and you do uh, digital twins and things like that so we can plug in early and see how we're doing. And also do trades on how our capabilities fit into larger force design 
uh, from not only Space Force, but joint perspective. So I know that's a lot of digital speak and all that to, to really get after everything has to be able to interoperate uh, from a joint perspective and doing in things digitally upfront allows us much more flexibility to do that. And it also cuts down on uh, cost and schedule uh, from an acquisition perspective. And that's what I'm after. Two other very specific questions about uh, doing business with uh, Space RCO. Uh, one is, what is the process to be read onto the Space RCO IDIQ? And the second is, um, is Space RCO advertising RFPs on the ARC? Uh, um, again, in reverse, I don't know what the ARC is. I, that's new to me. I don't know what that means. Um, uh, so if you give me some more specifics, I'll, I'll, I'll track it down or uh, maybe I can translate it. Um, but for the first part of it, um, so the process is that you reach out to uh, our uh, business intelligence, um, uh, um, uh, Severin Blinkish, and or you reach out to our contracting officer, who is uh, Colonel Owen Stevens, uh, and they will uh, have a discussion with you. And if it's the right uh, potential fit, it's easy to get right onto the contract. We'll, you'll give us five names. We'll get with them. We'll run them through the security aspects uh, quickly, and we'll get them read right on just like that. It's not hard. It's a less than a week process for all that. Uh, matter of fact, it could be as much less than 24 hours if it, everything works out right. Um, so that's not hard. It just has to be a match. So I'm not going to sit here and say everybody that calls or emails will be read in. That's just we we. It's an overhead that I don't think uh, makes sense for us if we're not a match, a potential match as far as capability um, of what we're trying to get after. Uh, so what? So is there any more on the arc? No, that we'll, we'll just leave it at that. I okay. we're, uh, we're just about to run out of time. Have one more question, then I'd like to give you an opportunity to kind of sum up, Mike, uh, and thank you again for your time. Last question is, um, have you had success in actually pulling any new entrants, uh, commercial companies, into one of your programs of record? Um, the answer is yes. Unfortunately, I can't talk about it. It is a classified program. Uh, but I can say the answer is yes. It's not like we don't, we just talk about it and don't do it. Uh, matter of fact, we've had two and I can't talk about either one of them, but uh, because our relationship with them would be classified as well, given what we're doing. But um, yes, we've had two commercial companies uh, that uh, have been entrants into what we're doing. And we're actually working through a couple of our uh, partners uh, at Air4L uh, for a few more that we're looking very closely at right now. Um, one of them has a Sibber and the other one is a more of an open uh, relationship um, that we're going to we're looking at uh, some uh, um, some capabilities, but I'll just leave it at that. But they, they those will be unclassified when we do them. I just don't want to uh, talk too much about those because we're in the early phases of them. Um, so yeah, so it's not like we just talk about it. They're absolutely uh, we we mean what we say and we go after it. It just has to be a good fit. I understand. Well, again, Mike, thank you so much for your time. Uh, any closing remarks you'd like to make? No, I don't think so. I think all I would really kind of reiterate is, hey, uh, not everybody can be rapid. Not everybody should be rapid, but we should all think rapidly, right? We should all look at ways to make our business better. And we should all make uh, look at ways to, to do things more uh, rapidly from the aspect of delivery. Uh, all of this is fun and it's all good to say and it's fun to talk about. But in the end, if you don't deliver, what are we doing it for? Right? So we're delivering capability fast and we're rapidly, I should say, and we're delivering capability the nation needs and, and we're happy to do that and I'm passionate about it and, and I'll be here as long as they let me stay here uh, to do that kind of stuff. And, uh, and, and I just ask everybody else to kind of look at it from the same perspective. And, and, and the reason I say everybody is because I'm only half the equation. I can go as rapid as I possibly can on the government side, but on the industry and commercial side, if they don't do the same thing to keep pace with me, in the end, we hit the same timelines we always hit before and we cannot afford that as a nation. Understand. Well, thanks very much again. Uh, one administrative question for you is we've had a number of uh, requests to uh, publish your slides. Is it okay with you if we use your slides, publish them on the NSSA website? Fantastic. Absolutely. We'll get those out shortly. Mike, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate your efforts and uh, Godspeed. So thank you all for uh, joining us today. And we look forward to uh, your participation in upcoming uh, space time events, and we uh, we greatly appreciate your time and efforts. Thank you all very much. Have a great day.